Hello. In this video, I'm going to talk about practice variability. So practice variability is a characteristic of practice that uh, increases the chances for future performance success. So it's really referring to um, practicing in a variety of different contexts and under a variety of different conditions. Uh, you might even include different variations of the same movement that's being learned. Um, and so increasing the amount of variability in all of these different conditions is going to increase the success of the person completing those uh, movements successfully um, in a performance or a competition setting or a testing setting. Um, so some of the benefits to performance from adding more variability to practice include um, better capability to perform the skill in future test situations. Um, so those test situations, that could be competition, that could be uh, someone who's rehabilitating and learning to walk again. The future test situation could be walking through a crowded mall and not falling. Uh, or carrying things while walking. So future test situation, that could mean all sorts of different things. Uh, so more variability in practice will better prepare the person to perform well in those future situations. Uh, likewise, it will give an increased capability to perform the skill in novel conditions like during competition. Um, so in most sports, most sports are primarily open skills. Um, and there are novel conditions that are taking place throughout the entire game or the entire competition. Um, so having more variability in practice will better prepare the person for a competition setting where there will be completely novel conditions that are taking place throughout that competition. Uh, we'll also increase performance error during practice, and that's a good thing. Um, so we want to experience performance error while we are practicing and learning a new skill. Uh, the more we error during practice, the more opportunities we have to problem solve, uh, learn how to do it correctly and solve the problem and correct the error so that we perform better uh, later on. Okay, so implementing practice variability. So for one, we want to vary the practice context. So if the skill is going to be performed in different contexts, so like somebody's rehabilitating, they're relearning how to walk, um, you need to be able to walk in any sort of different context. So through a crowded mall or through your home, um, maybe with the lights off when you're getting up to use the bathroom in the middle of the night. Like there are so many different uh, context in which we need to perform different skills. Um, so during practice, we want to make sure that we're getting a variety of different contexts for practice so that we're able to practice transferring those skills from one context to another. Uh, we also want to vary the practice conditions for closed skills, but uh, depending on whether there's intertrial variability or not intertrial variability, we will vary different uh, conditions. So let's say it's a closed skill and there's no intertrial variability of regulatory conditions. What that means is it's some kind of skill or sport or activity where the regulatory conditions, the conditions that specifically affect your ability to complete that skill, they're not varying from one trial to another. So a good example of that is like competition darts. So the um, dart board will be the same size and shape and probably colors and everything. You will be standing the same distance from that dart board and using darts that are of the same weight. So all of those are regulatory conditions that will be unchanging from one trial to the next. So one attempt to the next. Um, so in that kind of situation, um, the conditions that you would vary would be the non-regulatory conditions. So the conditions of practice that are not going to directly affect your ability to complete that skill, like changing the weight of the dart would really change how you perform the skill. But changing the amount of lighting in the room, that is a non-regulatory condition where it's not changing the movement or changing the, the implementation of the skill itself but it is changing the context, it's changing the environment a little bit. Um, and so those are the types of conditions that you would vary for a closed skill 
with no intertrial variability of regulatory conditions versus a closed skill where there is intertrial variability of regulatory conditions. That would be an activity like golf, for example. Um, so golf is a closed skill, but the, the what is happening with every single stroke while you're playing golf is going to be a little bit different because of where the ball is located for each stroke. So you might need to use a different club. You might need to be working around trees or sand pits or you're of different distance from the hole. So there's going to be a large amount of variability from one attempt to the next, depending on where that ball lands. Uh, so in that case, you would want to have variation or variability of both the regulatory and non-regulatory conditions. So what are the obstacles and things that are in the way? Um, those sort of, where's the ball relative to the hole? What is the distance? Which clubs are you using? Uh, but then also non-regulatory conditions like weather, for example. So playing on a bright sunny day versus a dark and cloudy day, or is it windy or changing the color of the ball? Like, are you so accustomed to a white ball that if the ball is now yellow, it, it interferes with your focus or, or ability to play? Um, so you want to make sure that you're varying all of those types of conditions. Uh, varying practice conditions for open skills. So with an open skill, every attempt is going to be different. So there's always going to be variability in regulatory and non-regulatory conditions. So you want to include as many um, variations of those skills and of those conditions as you possibly can. All right, contextual interference refers to the memory and performance disruption that results from performing multiple skills or variations of a skill within the context of practice. So now we're getting into um, the scheduling of the variability. So if we want variety in our practice, then the question becomes, well, do we block it? Like, do we schedule it in a block schedule? Like where we practice one skill or in one context or um, where the conditions are the same? Like, do we block it? So we do one this day, another that day, another that day. Or do we mix it all together? Do we provide a variety of experiences and kind of randomly assign them and randomly experience them, them throughout one practice? So the idea of contextual interference is that if we have a high amount of variability, uh, that means we're gonna have a high amount of contextual interference. Um, so we're gonna have disruption of the memory um, and application of those skills, basically, and that actually results in more learning. So when we have a uh, random variety of experiences and disruptions, and we're switching back and forth between different things, we are going to learn better. So I'll talk more about that and why that is. So high contextual interference would mean a practice schedule that has a random arrangement of trials um, so that we are practicing all different task variations during that one practice session. Um, versus the other end of the spectrum would be low contextual interference. So a practice schedule that organize, organizes the practice of each task variation in its own block or unit of time. Um, so those are the two extremes. And then, of course, we can have practice schedules that are sort of anywhere in between. Like maybe some practice days are low contextual interference where you focus on one particular skill. Um, and then other practice sessions might be of high contextual interference where there's a variety and sort of random assignment of trials. Um, so generally speaking, high contextual interference results in better performance on retention and transfer tests. Um, an interesting phenomenon is that when there's high contextual interference and the person who's practicing is asked after the fact to estimate how much they learned, we tend to underestimate how much we learned under the high contextual interference condition compared to low in contextual interference we tend to overestimate how much we learn. So when we are practicing the same thing again and again and again, we tend to be really confident that we learned that skill, even though less learning probably took place because we do learn more in high contextual interference 
sessions. Um, so we underestimate what we learned with a lot of interference and overestimate what we learned with no interference. Um, high contextual interference is optimal for learning skills with the lowest levels of difficulty, and it's optimal for more skilled individuals. Okay, so if we are learning skills that are not overly complex, then it's that's a good time for high contextual interference. Or if it's a learner who is more experienced and they are already pretty skilled in that activity, um, then even if the skills are more advanced and more complex, then high contextual interference is also better for those individuals. Low contextual interference is optimal for learning skills with the highest levels of difficulty. So movements that are very complex and very new, and especially for beginners, so it is also optimal for beginners, um, they will benefit more from being able to practice the same thing again and again and again without having contextual interference. But as those beginners learn those very complex movements, um, they will become more skilled and then they will be benefit more from high contextual interference. Uh, so the best course of action, just in general for most people and most types of skills, is a practice schedule with a moderate to high contextual interference. Um, and so if you start there, then you can always modify and adapt that schedule depending on how the learners are responding to that practice schedule. So if you find that it's not working well, maybe it's more stressful for the learner, maybe they're losing confidence in their ability, maybe they're just not learning as well as you might expect, then you can modify the schedule and add in more low contextual interference sessions. So add more block scheduling um, so that they can really practice the specific skills and dig deep on those skills until they feel a little bit more confident with them and then return back to a high contextual interference schedule. So why does this happen? What is the explanation for contextual interference? So there are two main hypotheses here. Both are likely true. Um, they are not fully fleshed out in the literature. Um, you know, they, there, uh, there is research available on both of these hypotheses, but it's not conclusive which is really at play here, and it's most likely both. Um, so the first is the elaboration hypothesis, which says that during random practice, a learner uses more memory storage and retrieval-related strategies than during block practice. Um, so the learner retains many skill variations in working memory and can compare variations so that they become distinct from one another. So the idea is that if in a random practice type of schedule where you're practicing all sorts of different closely related skills, like maybe learning a sport, um, so you're learning lots of different skills for that sport. If you're practicing all of those different skills mixed together within one practice, that gives you the opportunity to, for one, have to continually remember those skills and how to produce them. So you have to keep retrieving those strategies from memory. Uh, but then they're all contained in your working memory all simultaneously, and it gives the learner an opportunity to sort of compare and contrast the different movements and the different variations to help them really solidify and understand those movements and the differences between those movements. Uh, the action plan reconstruction hypothesis says that the interference requires a person to more actively reconstruct an action plan on the next practice trial for a particular skill variation. So the idea is that when we are going to complete a skill, we're going to go through a movement and, and engage in a skill. Um, we need to have an action plan. We need to come up with the motor plan and the strategy for how we are going to execute that skill. And so if for each trial, we are executing a different skill, then that means each time we have to reconstruct an entirely new action plan for the different skill. Compared to a blocked schedule where we're practicing the same skill again and again, then you really just have to come up with the action plan one time. And then you're sort of rehearsing, executing that same action plan again and again and again, maybe with slight changes to correct for errors. 
Um, but if we are doing something totally different with each trial, then we need a whole new action plan. We need to retrieve it from memory and execute it entirely freshly uh, rather than just the, the repeat of what we had just done previously. So again, it's not clear which one of these really is the explanation, and it's likely to be that both of these are working together. All right, thanks so much for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one.